bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Robert mentioned earlier today that he noticed that there was a theme running through our fighter verse, a, a same theme we, we found in, in our hymn of the month and, and even to a certain extent in our sermon series that we're doing for the month of September. That theme is devoting ourselves, dedicating ourselves to the work of the Lord. And there's one simple reason why we chose that theme for this month. Very shortly, we're going to be asking you for some money. Money above and beyond the tithes and offerings that you regularly give so that we can address some serious maintenance issues in the church. The sermon series is, is, is really designed to get you to think beyond your regular perspective, to, to cause you to dream bigger so that you're not afraid to, to give more and so you're not afraid to serve more. Next week, we'll, we'll be unveiling some of the details of our capital campaign, a capital campaign that we will run through the course of an entire year. Even now, I, be, I, I, I wanna begin to ask you to pray about what God would have you to give. And with that in mind, if you have your copy of God's Word with you this morning, I want you to turn in there with me to the book of Nehemiah, to Nehemiah, the second chapter. This morning, I want to inspire you to dream of a better life. This dream is reachable if by faith you put it in God's hands. Nehemiah chapter 2. When you get to that portion of God's word, announce that you've arrived by saying amen. We are discussing together Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 11 through verse 20. But I, but I want to focus our reading this morning on the dialogue of verse 17 through verse 20. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 through verse 20. Hear the word of the Lord for you this morning, Central. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Zanbalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed this. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We as servants will start rebuilding, but as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Will you pray with me? Lord, teach us great things through your word. Let our hearts be open for what your spirit will have to say to us. And as always, we pray that you would be exalted as your word is explained. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all who are God's people said, Amen. Amen. What would it be like to live in a world where you could not dream? This is the premise behind Gabriel Garcia Marquez's Spanish novel, 100 Years of Solitude. 100 Years of Solitude covers seven generations of the Buendia family in the town of Macondo. Hosea 
is the founding patriarch of Macondoa, a town that he and his wife Ursula established after leaving their small village in Colombia in search of a better life. Macondo is the city of Jose and Ursula's dream. Literally, Jose dreamed about the city of Macondo and he built the city according to the exact specifications of a dream that he had by the riverside one night. Soon after its foundation, however, Macondo was anything but the place Jose and Ursula dreamed of. Rather than being a, a place of peace and tranquility, Macondo becomes a place of terrible misfortune and, and tragedy. It is plagued by constant civil war and social unrest, all the things that Jose and Ursula tried to leave behind. And as years go on, as the Buendia family grow and multiply in Macondo, something strange begins to take place in that city. The people of the village of Macondo are plagued by terrible bouts of insomnia. They are unable to sleep for days, sometimes weeks at a time. The insomnia is so bad in Macondo that the people begin to suffer from forgetfulness because they are simply not sleeping. They forget where they live. They forget what they should be doing. They, they even forget what is proper to eat. And to combat this forgetfulness, they have to label everything in the village so the people who are suffering from the insomnia can know exactly what to do and what to eat. Things in the city become so bad that the Buendia family are almost at a place where they are willing to give up on their dream. Macondo becomes a terrible example of how painful it is for us to make our dreams come true. One critic writes of the city of Macondo, the city represents the dream of a brave new world, a world that was cruelly proved unreal by the course of history. And after you've read the book, the sad lesson of a hundred years of solitude, the moral of the story is this, that you and I, we should not dream. We shouldn't dream of having a better life. We, we shouldn't dream of a better career. We, we shouldn't dream of reaching high educational levels. We, you and I, we, we shouldn't dream about a happier marriage. We, we shouldn't dream about a better world because the reality is that life will sometimes turn our dreams into nightmares. You and I know something about that. We've had long held dreams, but because of the life situation that we currently find ourselves in, our dreams have become nightmares, but, but that doesn't have to be the case. There, there is a better way. You can hold on to your dreams this morning simply by handing your dreams over to God entrusting your dreams to God, and God is able to revive your dreams so that your dreams won't die. The book of Nehemiah is the story of a man who had a dream. Nehemiah had a dream to reestablish his city. Nehemiah had a dream to rebuild the walls that surrounded his city. It's a dream that is approximately 70 years in the making. To to fully understand the genesis of this dream, we need to review a story. A story that began with Israel's sin. And because of Israel's sin, God brought judgment against the Israelites in the form of a, a foreign army, the, the Babylonians. Seventy years prior to Nehemiah's return to Jerusalem, Jerusalem had been razed and completely destroyed by a Babylonian army. They, they went into the city and burned everything in the city down. Moreover, after they completely destroyed the city, the Babylonians carried off 
thousands of previous inhabitants of the city into exile with them. Nehemiah, when he reviews the history, the unfortunate history of Jerusalem in chapter one in his prayer, he, he recognizes that everything that God allowed to happen to Jerusalem, the Israelites deserved that. It was because they no longer listened to the word of God. It was because that they were disobedient to God's instructions that God allowed these things to happen. They deserved it. But even if Israel deserved what happened to them, one of the lingering questions of the exile and of the destruction of Israel is, what would happen to the relationship between God and his people? Would, would God still be faithful to his people in spite of their sin? The answer to this question comes 70 years later after the destruction of Israel, when another foreign power slowly starts letting the exiled people return back to Jerusalem. The, the good news for the Israelites and, and the good news for us this morning is that though we may be unfaithful to God, God remains faithful to us. There are times when our actions demand judgment. And there are times when God will let the consequences of our disobedience fall upon us. But just because God judges us doesn't mean that God is ever willing to give up on us. God was not willing to give up on the people of Israel. The first group of exiles returned to Jerusalem. And when they got there, things were worse than they ever imagined. The, the city was in total disrepair. Before Jerusalem could be revitalized and repopulated, Jerusalem needed to be rebuilt. The people who initially returned to Jerusalem busied themselves with rebuilding their own homes, busied themselves with establishing a future for themselves, but, but there was one important element left out. A city's wall was often the first and only defense of a city. Someone needed to take charge for rebuilding the city wall to ensure that the people in the city would be protected. Enter Nehemiah, who takes a leave of absence from his job to lead the fourth group of exiles back to Jerusalem. And unbeknownst to the people that Nehemiah is leading, he has a dream. His intent is to return to Jerusalem, not to establish a home for himself, but his dream is to rebuild the wall so, so that the people could be protected. It's an ambitious building project, in part because Nehemiah doesn't have the experience or the ingenuity to lead a project of this size. Many of us, if we heard Nehemiah's dream, would say that it's only a pipe dream. Nehemiah, you can't do it. But yet, Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem fully expecting his dream to come to fruition. And when Nehemiah finally arrives in Jerusalem, the Bible tells us that he spends the first three days getting reacquainted with the city and establishing perhaps a place of a residency for himself. It is only after these initial three days in the city does Nehemiah begin to assess the task ahead of him. Nehemiah's first recorded activity in the city of Jerusalem is to look at the wall and assess the difficulties associated with the task at hand. He makes a realistic appraisal of what could and what could not be done. He does this under the cover of darkness, accompanied with a group of people who are there to protect him. But Nehemiah is, is so uncertain of his dream, he does not even tell the people who are with him what his dream is. There, there are certain dreams that you and I have that seem so far-fetched that we're afraid to tell anybody about it. Nehemiah is, is in that position, but, but eventually, at some point, Nehemiah has to tell someone 
about his dream. That point is in chapter 2, verse 17, where Nehemiah reveals the content of his dreams, where Nehemiah reveals to, to the people, to the officials, why he came back to Jerusalem in the first place. But, but more than simply revealing to people the content of his dreams, Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, gives us reason why we should hold on to our dreams ourselves. You and I, Nehemiah held on to his dream because he understood that God was in charge of the yeses and the noes of his life. In verse 18, Nehemiah tells the story of how he was put in position to return to Jerusalem in the first place. Nehemiah was a, a cupbearer in the court of the Persian king Artaxerxes when he felt a strong draw to return to Jerusalem, to return and, and build the wall. But in order for, for Nehemiah to, to leave his position, he had to first get permission from the king. Not only did he need permission from the king, Nehemiah also needed provisions from the king. <laughs> Nehemiah needed to ask the king for permission to, to leave and return to Jerusalem. He then needed to ask the king for the king's help. King, can you provide for me the resources that I need to build back the walls? The, the king would need to get these material resources from his own supply. To put it in perspective, to, to help us understand what Nehemiah had to ask the king. It's like you going to your boss to ask for an indefinite leave of absence, an indefinite paid leave of absence. Then you also have the gall to ask your boss for the company car with the company credit card. You're not done yet. Not only do you need an indefinite paid leave of absence, not only do you need the company car with the company credit card, you, you also need your boss to go into his bank account, but not loan you some money, give you some money. How do you think that'll work out for you? <laughs> Nehemiah, though he is the cupbearer to the king, Though the cupbearer and the king also often shared a, a special relationship, Nehemiah is still only the king's servant. They have a relationship, but that of vassal to the Lord. And, and there's another thing that adds complexity to what Nehemiah has to ask the king. Before he can even speak to the king, the king has to grant Nehemiah permission to say something. So, Nehemiah has to first hope that the king notices him, allows Nehemiah to speak, and then when Nehemiah does make the request, he has to hope that the king is predisposed to that request and grant him that request. But, but sure enough, we read in, in chapter two that the king notices Nehemiah's sullen and sunken appearance, and the king asks Nehemiah, is there something wrong? Gotcha. <laughs> Nehemiah then tells the king of everything that he wants to do and of everything that he hopes to happen. And get this, not only does the king give Nehemiah a leave of absence, not only does the king grant Nehemiah the resources to rebuild the wall, the king gives Nehemiah more than what he asked for. He, he also sends with him protection for the journey. But notice in verse 18, when Nehemiah retells the story, he, he doesn't say anything about what the king did. He doesn't say, I, I thank the king because he was so gracious to me. I, I'm grateful to the king because without the king, this wouldn't have happened. When, when Nehemiah gives the credit, he gives the sole credit to God and to God alone. <laughs> Nehemiah says in verse 18, 
that it was because of the gracious hand of God that he received this fortune. Nehemiah's words say something to us about Nehemiah's theological understanding of power. Though there may be people who are put in positions of power over you, it is God who controls your destiny. There are people who may say yes and no to your request, but ultimately it is God who gives the word that allows things to happen in your life. Nehemiah, in fact, before he asked the king, made his request in chapter two, verses four and five, the Bible tells us that Nehemiah first prayed to God. Ne ne Nehemiah understood who was really in control. The, the king asked him, what is wrong? What can I do? And the Bible tells us before Nehemiah responded, Nehemiah prayed first. H.G.M. Williamson in his commentary on Nehemiah writes, Nehemiah's correct perspective is seen here as he first points to God's favor as the cause for their change in fortune and only secondly to the king as God's instrument. Nehemiah's perspective on the relationship between God and the king is a reminder of the perspective you and I need to have of the relationship between God and every other person put in a position of power in our lives. Though they may have authority, God is the one in control. It is God who ultimately says yes or no. It is God who grants requests. It is God who opens doors. It is God who ensures opportunities. Proverbs 21.1 says that it is the Lord who controls the heart of the king and that God channels the king's heart like a stream of water towards all who please him. That's why you, you and I should, should never be afraid of entrusting our dreams and our desires to God because though people may be put in positions of power over you, the reality is in order for our dreams to proceed, it is God who needs to say yes or no. I graduated from high school with the lowest possible GPA that you can graduate from high school with. In fact, it's unfair to say that I graduated from high school. It's almost like they just sent me away. 16 months after my high school class graduated, I graduated. I went to pick up my diploma in the principal's office and he gave it to me and he told me I thought you would never make it. Shortly after receiving my diploma, my high school diploma, I, I, I had this dream, this vision of going to college. And in fact, there were people around me, my mentor at the time, shared this dream and vision of, of me going to college, but, but there was no way I was, I was going to get into to college. I had the lowest G PA ever, yet and still, my mentor encouraged me to send out one application. It was to a college that, that she and an organization that she was working with had a, had a relationship with. And she hoped that because of the relationship that, that they would allow me to enter into their college. But my grades didn't justify me stepping foot on campus, let alone me taking classes at that school. The relationship that she thought the organization and this college had was, was strained. They had sent a, a young man the previous year to that college and, and, and he just raised hell. He, he, he fought with the professors and in fact, after one semester, they, they, they told him to get out of this school and the admissions director promised, swore, that they would never let another student from that program into college. I filled out my application two weeks before college officially started, long after the application process had been closed. A few days later, I received a letter telling me that I had been admitted into this college. When, 
when I arrived on campus. When I arrived on campus, the, the admissions director was there to meet me. And he told me, I don't know why we let you on campus. You a lucky man that I'm in charge. And he was right. I don't know why they let me on campus. Uh, my grades didn't justify, forget about my later academic success. I, I didn't deserve to be, to go to college based on what I did in high school. But, but he was wrong <laughs> that he was in charge. Over and above him, saying yes to my application was a sovereign God who still remains in control of all things. That's why you and I don't have to appeal to, to our bosses. We don't have to appeal to an HR director. We, we don't have to appeal to an admissions counselor. You and I can go straight to the top and make our appeals to God. And it is God who says yes, and it is God who says no. And, and I know I'm right about it because I know some of your stories. Some of you have gotten a yes when you should have gotten a no. <laughs> Some of you have gotten a here it is when you should have gotten a when pigs fly. Some of you have gotten a I will let you in when you should have gotten there's no way in the world are you getting in here. Some of you have gotten things that you don't deserve and opportunities that you didn't earn all because God said yes and because God said yes no man can say no. Nehemiah held on to his dreams in spite of how impossible the task ahead of him looked because he understood it is a sovereign God who says yes and a sovereign God who says no. It is a sovereign God who is in control of our destiny. Nehemiah was able to overcome one obstacle to his dream that of insufficient provisions. When God said yes, because God said no, yes, Artaxerxes had to say yes. He, he allowed Nehemiah to, to return to Jerusalem with the necessary provisions to begin the rebuilding process. But, but there is another obstacle, another threat to Nehemiah's dream that, that Nehemiah has to overcome. That of human opposition. Verse 19 mentions two names that will become familiar to all of us who are readers of the book of Nehemiah because of how they work to undermine and ruin the building project and destroy Nehemiah's dream. Zanbalat and Tobiah, two high-ranking foreign officials who for whatever reason oppose the rebuilding of the wall. Why they oppose Nehemiah and his dream is, is never made clear. But whenever they are around, they seek to destroy the work that Nehemiah is doing. And more than that, their intensity, the intensity of their opposition grows whenever we meet them in scripture. And in verses two, in chapter two, verse 10, they simply are disturbed by the work Nehemiah is doing. Later on in, in verse 19, their disturbance turns into derision. And later on in the book of Nehemiah, their derision will turn into plots to murder Nehemiah. And moreover, after they plot against Nehemiah to have him killed, they plot to destroy the work entirely. You and I should, should not be surprised that Nehemiah had to deal with opposition. The one unfortunate truism of life is that whenever you try to progress in life, you will often face opposition for no reason at all other than people will hate to see you progress in life. In his book, Hand Me Another Brick, How Effective Leaders Motivate, Charles Swindoll writes, when a person knows he is following God's will, it is unusual if there is not at least one person who opposes him. I have rarely known it to be otherwise. In fact, sometimes the only reason 
you and I will know that we're going in the right direction, that we're doing the work of God, that we are progressing in life, is that for some reason, we suddenly face opposition. Like yin and yang, opposition and opportunity seem to go together. If you want to progress, if you want to bring your dream to fruition, if you want to fulfill God's calling on your life, know this, you will face opposition. In Nehemiah's life, opposition came from external and expected sources in and Zanbalat and Tobiah. And in Nehemiah's life, opposition came from unexpected and internal sources. In verse 17, Nehemiah, Nehemiah makes his case to the officials as to why the wall should be rebuilt. And after presenting his case, these officials seem very enthusiastic about helping Nehemiah achieve his dream. So you would think, these are the same officials that, that we find out in the book of Ezra not only were reluctant to work in rebuilding the temple, they often opposed the work that Ezra was doing in rebuilding the temple. And these officials in the book of Nehemiah would also be reluctant to work, and they would hinder the efforts of, of Nehemiah to rebuild the wall by hindering the efforts of other people who were willing to help Nehemiah truly. You and I will face opposition from external sources, but it hurts the most when we face opposition from internal sources, from, from people who are close to us, from people who are supposed to help us achieve our dreams. And it is these officials who stood the most to gain by having the, the wall rebuilt because it's these officials that had most in the city that needed to be protected. It is often the people who benefit the most from our work, who benefit the most from our dreams, who will, do, who will contribute the least amount of effort to help us fulfill our dreams. The, the people who will gain the most from your sacrifice, the, the people who will profit the most from your dreams, the people who will reap the most rewards from what you do, are at times the people who are least likely to lift a finger to try to help you and discourage you in your work. In preschool, we all heard and, and remember the story of the little red hen. It's the story of a red hen who finds a, a piece of grain a piece of a grain of wheat and then attempts to enlist the other farm animals to help her plant that piece of grain, that piece of wheat. Re re remember what the farm animals said when the little red hen tried to recruit them to help? Who will help me plant this seed? Not I, said the pig. <laughs> Not I, said the goat. Not I, said the dog. Later, when, when the plant had grown and, and pr when the seed had grown and, and produced a harvest, she, she needed someone to help her collect the harvest. And, and she again tried to recruit the, the other farm animals to help her. Not I, said the dog. Not I, said the pig. Not I, said the goat. A after she had done the work of collecting the harvest by herself, she she needed someone to, to help her to, to mill the grain in, into flour. And she again en, enlists the, the help of the other farm animals only to hear the same response. Not, not I, said the pig. Not, not I, said the goat. Not, not I, said the dog. Then when it was time to, to bake the bread, she needed more help. Not I said the dog, not, not I, said the pig, not I, said the goat. But when it finally came time to eat the bread <laughs> that the little red hen had baked all by herself, she didn't recruit anybody to help her eat the bread. They volunteered 
to help her eat the bread. I will, said the dog, I will, said the pig, I will, said the goat. In Central, there will be people like that in your life. People who don't want to raise a finger to help you get there, but once you get there, want to reap the benefits. How did Nehemiah deal with that? How did he prevent himself from, from being discouraged and, and giving up on life? How, 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 did, how did Nehemiah resolve that despite the internal opposition that he would face, the, despite the in external opposition that was to come, how did he deal with this? Verse 20 provides us the answer. Nehemiah found the strength to hold on to his dreams, not only because God is in charge of the yeses and the noes of his life. Nehemiah found the strength to hold on to his dreams because it is only be through God's efforts that you and I will find success. He says in verse 20, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. This statement is significant not because of what Nehemiah says will be ultimately responsible for his success. It's significant because of what Nehemiah says is not responsible for his success. Yes, it would take a lot of human effort to rebuild the wall, but, but Nehemiah doesn't say he will succeed because of human effort. Yes, it will take all the leadership skills that Nehemiah has to, to motivate a group of reluctant people who do not want to work. But Nehemiah never says that, that I'm a good leader. This is the reason why I will succeed. Yes, it will take Nehemiah fighting off the opposition. But Nehemiah never says, I'm a good fighter. That's the reason I'm going to succeed. Nehemiah says, the success of the building project, the success of my dream, is ultimately dependent on God. Think about that for a second, Central. Think of how freeing that is for your dream. That, that your success doesn't work, depend on how hard you work, though you need to work hard. Your success doesn't depend on the skills that you have, though, though you need to work to develop your skills. Your success doesn't depend on how much of a fighter you are, though you need to be a fighter to be successful. Your success is completely in the hands of God, therefore you should turn over whatever you're working on, turn over whatever your project into God's hands. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul gives us a, something, a statement that, that characterizes his ministry that should characterize our life in general, the, the Corinthians had developed into, had grown into factions. They, they, they were praising and, and, and almost worshiping the men who they felt were responsible for their salvation. Paul says that some of the Corinthians claimed that they followed Apollos. Some of the Corinthians claimed that, that they followed Paul. To, to, to end these factions, Paul helps the Corinthians remember where credit is due. He says in, in 1 Corinthians that though he planted and Apollos watered, it was God who gave the increase. He says he put a lot of effort into what he did, but ultimately it was this God who decided whether or not his project grew. And what Paul says is true of ministry is also true of life, that it is God who gives the increase. It is God who determines whether or not we succeed, so it is God the one we need to appeal to. If our success is dependent on God, if our dreams only come true because God allows it, then our service and our appeal should only be to the sovereign God who is in control of all things. Central, will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your word and for the lesson that it teaches. Thank you that 
you still are sovereignly in control of all things, Lord God. And, and only with your help can we ever hope to achieve our dreams. Now we pray, Father God, that your spirit would work in the midst of our sanctuary, Lord God, bringing people to faith in you, Lord God, or, or just people bringing people to a greater dependence on you, Father God. We give this time over to you, and we pray that your spirit would work, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.